a virtual global financial symposium, the economic impacts of COVID-19 on credit unions. We've got a great agenda today. My name is Greg Newman. I'm the Director of Communications for Royal Council of Credit Unions. Today, we've got presentations on the global economic consequences of COVID-19, a multi-country analysis by Kamiar Mohadas. He's an economist at the Cambridge Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge and a fellow in economics at King's College, Cambridge. We also have a presentation on how COVID-19 is impacting United States credit unions and their finances by Mike Schenk. He's the Deputy Chief Advoc Advocacy Officer for Policy Analysis and the Chief Economist for Credit Union National Association, or CUNA, here in the US. Then it's the effects of COVID-19 on Latin American credit unions by Adrian Rodriguez. He is the CEO of the Federation of Savings and Credit Cooperatives of Costa Rica. And finally, Caribbean credit unions and the pandemic. We'll hear from Patrick Antoine. He is a consultant on international finance, economic policy, international trade, agricultural policy at Econotech Limited in Trinidad and Tobago. Just a couple of housekeeping notes for you today. There is Spanish translation available for this webinar. You should see a button at the bottom of your screen where you can select that option. And if you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You can type your question in there questions in there, I will ask them of the speakers as time allows. So we're going to get started with Kamir Mohadas. He is a macroeconomist at the Judge Business School at the University of Cambridge. His main areas of research include applied macroeconomics and global and national ma uh, macro econometric modeling. He is currently a consultant at the Asian Development Bank and has previously served as a departmental special advisor at the Bank of Canada, a consultant at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, and a regular visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund. He's going to speak about the findings of a recent study on the economic consequences of COVID-19 that he conducted with a team of economists from other esteemed institutions. I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Mahatas. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Greg, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk uh, today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work on the macroeconomic consequences of the of COVID-19 and uh, and uh, really and basically describing why I think it's a bit of a different shock and what sort of what sort of recovery we should be expecting in the next uh, couple of uh, quarters till the end of 2021. So the world has seen many crises over the last few decades. We had the oil shock in 73-74 due to the OPEC oil embargo. We had the 78-79 oil shock due to the Iranian revolution. We experienced the global financial crisis in 2008-09, which, which is probably fresh in everybody's um, memory. Uh, but this time, uh, the shock is very different. And uh, for the first time since the Great Depression, the world is experiencing a global shock like no other. Um, it which involves uh, simultaneous disruptions to both supply and demand, and it's happening in an interconnected world economy. So on the supply side, as you know, infections reduce the labor supply and productivity, the lockdowns uh, uh, and business closures and social distancing measures taken in almost all countries uh, uh, cause supply disruptions. On, on the demand side, the layoffs and loss of income from quarantining, from unemployment, and worsen econ uh, economic prospects uh, due to a reduction in household consumption and firm investment uh, have obviously a huge impact. And on top of that, we have an extremely, extremely uncertain uh, information about the path, duration, the magnitude, the in and, the, and, and overall, all of these things make the impact of the uh, pandemic very severe and could in fact create a vicious cycle of dampening business and consumer confidence and, and tightening financial conditions, which could in itself lead to further job losses and reduction in investment with potential implications for even long-term growth. So how do we quantify this uh, economic effects uh, of the COVID-19 shock? Well, the key challenges for all policymakers and uh, any empirical uh, economic analysis of the COVID-19 shock are, you know, in my opinion, there are a number, and, and one of them is how to identify this unprecedented shock, uh, how to account for its nonlinear effect. We know that extreme events have nonlinear effects. Uh, how do we consider cross-country spillover? This is not just an issue happening in isolation in one part of the world, in one country, in one region. It's a global event. And how do we 
basically quantify the uncertainty surrounding any forecast that, will, that we would be given. Uh, given that it's unprecedented. So in a recent study with colleagues at the Dallas Fed International Monetary Fund, uh, Un uh, University of Southern California and, and John Hopkins University, we, uh, we try to address these, uh, these questions. And in particular, uh, we offer what we think is a unique identification strategy of the COVID-19 shock, where we use the GDP growth revisions of the International Monetary Fund in April and June 2020 and compare them to their end of 2019 forecast uh, to identify the COVID-19 shock. The argument here is that uh, nobody could foresee the impacts of the COVID shock in December 2019, um, even our, our colleagues at the International Monetary Fund. So I want to give you some of the results that we have. Um, the, the way to read these figures is basically these are counterfactual results uh, for and give us some indication for what would happen, uh, what, what happens uh, relative to the absence of the shock between 2020 Q1 and end of 2021. So the solid lines, if you can see them, they are the median responses and the bounds, the uh, different colors, they, they represent the range of likely outcomes, the uncertainty. So the Obviously, the uncertainty around these uh, forecasts are pervasive because of the severity and duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, global spillovers, financial market volatility, the ability of uh, policy actions to protect uh, households and firms, and, and the success of the what we've now heard, pharmaceutical uh, interventions to contain the spread of the coronavirus, not just in particular countries, but, uh, but globally. So, what these results tell us is that the COVID-19 pandemic would leave the 2021 uh, Q4 uh, GDP about three percentage points uh, lower than what would have been the case in the absence of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and you, um, you might notice that the, uh, the negative impact on advanced economies is particularly large. And here I'm thinking about the UK and the, and the US. And for advanced economies, the effects actually in our sample range from two percentage points below the pre-crisis uh, pre path uh, of GDP by the end of 2021. And that would be in the Euro area to six and a half percentage points uh, in the United States. So this is quite, it's quite large uh, impacts on the advanced, on the advanced economies. Um, among emerging markets, uh, the impact varies substantially. Uh, uh, the impact of the COVID shock varies substantially. Uh, and this is mainly because in addition to the domestic shocks, so here is health crisis and the lockdowns, uh, these countries have also been facing, as you know, a range of external shocks, so plunging trade, uh, collapsing tourism in many, many countries, heavily dependent on tourism, uh, capital outflows, and falling commodity prices for the major commodity exporters have been a, a, a disaster in some cases. Uh, although these impacts are also, also varies uh, ac according to what type of country uh, we're looking at. Um, but the effects also depend on their economic structures, obviously. Uh, so some countries will rely very heavily on certain sectors as opposed to others. Um, so emerging Asia, actually excluding China here, uh, the first graph, is expected to be less affected by COVID-19 than Latin America, say. And this is mainly due to higher um, uh, commodity dependence of, of Latin America in particular and, and, and tighter financial conditions, but also because we've seen in Latin America, uh, the countries have been su uh, less successful uh, than emerging Asia in containing the pandemic. So this is, this is very important. And as you know, workers in some sectors such as travel, tourism, and hospitality services are disproportionately affected by the COVID shock. And, and low-income households actually in, within these countries uh, tend to suffer much more uh, because they don't have access to healthcare and, and they have limited savings to, to name a few. Um, and as I said, countries or regions that rely heavily on oil revenues, tourism, and exports of goods and services are particularly vulnerable. So, uh, for instance, in the Middle East, where we have you know, a very high oil dependence, uh, and Latin America, as I mentioned, commodity dependence, and tourism in, in, in a lot of the countries uh, in the world. What about China, you may ask? 
So uh, this is a photo of the Wuhan uh, Maya uh, Beach Water Park. I think it was the second week of August 2020. I, I mean, who would have expected in March that in Wuhan, thousands of people would be packed shoulder to shoulder with no face masks? Um, I, I, I quite like this photo because it illustrates how different really the Chinese experience has been compared to uh, most of the rest of the world, in fact. And in terms of the speed of the economic recovery, China is an exception, and I, I, I would uh, suggest because of three reasons. First of all, the country was very successful in, uh, in, the, in sort of um, uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic. Uh, in fact, most of the country had reopened by uh, early April. Um, it has lower size of inward spillovers. And I think most importantly, as opposed to the global financial crisis, uh, the COVID-19 shock uh, hit services globally much harder than manufacturing. Obviously, in services, it is much more difficult to socially distance than it is in manufacturing. So that, I think that, that was a, that, that these three are the important thing that was happening in, in China. I want to take the other extreme, which is China dealt with the, uh, with the COVID-19 shock very effectively. In Sweden, we do an exercise where we look at in Sweden and we say, what would have happened if the COVID shock occurred in all of the countries in the world. So that's to the, to the, the first graph uh, in color. And the second uh, graph in black and white shows you what would have happened if the COVID-19 shock had not, uh, you know, or the COVID pandemic had not uh, affected Sweden. And what you notice is if you compare these two graphs, what they tell us is the importance of spillovers uh, and mainly through disruptions in global supply chains, travel, tourism, and, what it tells us as well is that no country can shield itself from the adverse economic effects of COVID by following less stringent lockdowns. And this is mainly because of the interconnections and global nature of, uh, of the shock. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that being less stringent, uh, actually economically we might benefit. In, the, in that sense, there is no trade-off between health and economic outcomes. Um, we also look at uh, long-term interest rates, and we notice that long-term interest rates in advanced economies in the medium term could fall by 100 basis points below their pre-COVID uh, lows. And this is because the obviously crisis raises precautionary savings and, and dampens investment demand. However, a word of warning, the same cannot be said with certainty for the emerging market economies where borrowing rates can increase rapidly. Um, so uh, a word of caution in terms of the emerging economies. Uh, uh, in, the, in August 2020, Bill Gates said that the COVID-19 pandemic will be over by the end of 2021. Um, while it might be true that with these three um, looks like successful vaccines, uh, which hopefully will be on the market very soon and distributed uh, to, to people around the world, uh, might end the pandemic by end of 2021. Uh, our counterfactual analysis suggests that the effects, the economic effects of the pandemic are going to be large and they're going to be persistent and they're going to be negative for the, for the world economy and no country escaping here. It looks like China and emerging Asia will actually uh, do better than the, in the near term at least than the, than the rest of the countries. Um, and uh, where, whereas also non-emerging non markets are actually particularly vulnerable. Um, I, want to, I want to conclude with saying that our findings uh, really highlight the importance of comprehensive and coordinated uh, policy responses to the pandemic and any global shock, in fact. And for, in this case, it would include a, 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 a swift deployment of medical resources, now that, including the vaccines that we've seen by by the three vaccines that seem to be successfully uh, successful. So, and we also need to think about policy interventions in the case that uh, restoring to restore financial markets, the function of financial markets is extremely important. We also, in the meantime, need to also maintain uh, support for households and firms. So even though these vaccines will roll on the market, this, the, the, the economic uh, impacts will not end there and there will be uh, we will see them in the next few quarters, if not to the end of 2021. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamiar. And, and I have to say again, thanks so much for, for taking the time for us today. Um, I'm going to have a couple questions here for you from the attendees for today's webinar. And 
and thanks for submitting these. We have a question from Barry in the UK who says, the UK is now embarking on a new economic revolution prompted by Brexit, COVID-19. How does, uh, he asked the panel, but I'll ask you, how do you think this will accelerate growth and spread well-being throughout the populace? Yeah, I, I mean, I think before, um, before the uh, pandemic, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of sort of a, a green agenda, the green recovery, et cetera. Uh, before the pandemic, a lot of emphasis was on dealing with climate change. Uh, a lot of the emphasis was on building, you know, we want to build for the better. Uh, the problem with the pandemic has been that all these sort of uh, build back better or, or um, uh, all these um, impacts, uh, the positive impacts that we would have experienced in the absence of the pandemic, we had to slow those down. And the main reason is we had to think about the recovery. We had to think about them now. So uh, I think the policy agenda in terms of well-being in terms of creating better was actually stalled a bit. But the good news is, uh, I, I think from the COVID shock is that it highlights how vulnerable our economies are and how important it is actually to think about the bigger issues like climate change risk. Uh, you know, climate change risk is potentially much worse than a COVID risk. So yeah, I am hopeful that the, the COVID shock uh, actually accelerates uh, our thinking in terms of building, uh, you know, in terms of building green and in terms of emphasizing a recovery, which is a green recovery, um, absolutely. But I think uh, as with any major shock like the financial crisis, uh, the uh, global financial crisis, uh, uh, environmental issues and uh, you know issues of increasing well-being takes a back seat until we have the recovery. Very good. Uh, Peter in St, uh, excuse me, uh, Robert in St. Lucia asks, will the effects of COVID-19 likely impact global exchange rates in your mind? Yes. So, I mean, I think they, they operate through different channels. Yes, I would say yes. Uh, we, we didn't explicitly look at it in, in our modeling uh, framework. But yes, I think, uh, I, I think that's absolutely true. This will affect uh, uh, exchange rates. And they, they will depend on what type of country you are. In. It will depend on your depend dependency on commodities, on tourism. Absolutely, this could have a this could have a major impact for some countries, and not not so much others. Any big shock will do, uh, right? So if you think about Brexit, the uh, question before was about Brexit. After the Brexit shock, we observed a huge, huge uh, shock to the exchange market. So yes, absolutely. Okay, well that actually does it for the attendee questions, Dr. Mahadas. Once again, I just want to thank you so much for joining us and and come back anytime because that was thank really informative. Much. All right, pleasure. thank you thank so you much. much. All right. Well, we are now pleased to be joined by Mike Schenk. He is the Chief Economist and Deputy Chief Advocacy Officer for Policy Analysis for Credit Union National Association, or CUNA, as it's known here in the United States. He conducts economic research and supports CUNA's public relations and advocacy efforts. His analyses regularly appear in trade publications, such as Credit Union Magazine, and he is also a frequent contributor to the financial media. He's going to talk about the specific economic impacts of COVID-19 on credit unions here in the United States. Mike. Thanks, Greg. Good morning, everybody. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and to share a little bit of our perspective on uh, the global pandemic, its effects on the macro economy here in the United States, and more importantly, the, the direct effects on consumers, credit union members, and credit unions themselves. I think one of the most important things that Kamiar said in his presentation is that the effects of the pandemic are likely to be large, are likely to be persistent, and are likely to be negative. And that uh, directly aligns with our point of view. Uh, so um, let me just talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the ground and what we're concerned with from an economic perspective. Before I do that, I wanna just take a minute and remind everybody that here in the United States, credit unions really were conceived and formally recognized as a distinct financial services alternative during crisis. Credit unions were created by federal policymakers in the United States back during the Great Depression. And the, the reason that policymakers enacted the, credit un, the Federal Credit Union Act here in the United States back in the 1930s was because they specifically recognized the credit union difference resulted in differences and, and, and more positive behaviors in the marketplace compared to for-profit alternatives that existed at that time. 
Uh, specifically, they recognize that credit unions, because of our structure, not-for-profit, democratically controlled, member-owned, that credit unions in the United States, and elsewhere, of course, but credit unions in the United States behave differently. Because of that structure, we view collectively capital as a war chest to be built up during good times and to be used, not used up, but to be used during tough times. And that means, as a practical matter, that credit unions in crisis situations are engaged in the marketplace, are lending to people who need access to capital instead of behaving like for-profit institutions, which generally speaking, in crisis situations, turn people away, uh, severely tighten underwriting standards, making access to, to credit much more difficult. And of course, they do that because of their structure. They're legally obligated in the for-profit sector to maximize outside shareholder value. And that means that during crisis situations, these entities consistently over time, in crisis situations, essentially hunker down and lick their wounds and turn people away uh, instead of focusing on getting people to the other side of the crisis as quickly as possible. We clearly saw that during the Great Recession back in 2007, 8, and 9. And you can see that on this graphic where I've created an index of credit union lending and another index of bank lending. The dotted line is the bank experience. The red line is credit union lending throughout the crisis and in the, uh, in the wake of the crisis for several years. You can see from this graphic that, generally speaking, uh, credit union lending increased throughout the crisis and the aftermath, and bank lending generally declined during that period of time. On the next slide, we can see what credit unions have done during the current crisis. And essentially, the takeaway is that credit unions continue to behave in the ways that we expect them to behave. Almost all credit unions in the United States almost immediately on the onset of the COVID-19 crisis began to loan, uh, offer loan modifications to their members. 90% of credit unions told us in the surveys that we conducted that they were waiving fees for members. And nearly 90% created new loan products to respond to members' unique needs uh, during the, the COVID crisis. Now, these are the percentage of U.S. credit unions there are roughly 5,300 U.S. credit unions in the United States today. If we were to look at the percentage of members that have access to these modifications and these various services, the percentages would even be higher. Larger institutions are uh, more likely to be doing this sort of activity because they have more resources and are better able uh, to, to uh, interact uh, in very difficult times. So uh, that's what we're seeing in terms of products and services. I should also mention that uh, by various measures of government uh, activity, uh, credit unions have been engaged. We've uh, originated roughly 200,000 paycheck protection uh, program loans. These are small business loans that help small businesses continue to pay their employees even though the employees were not at work. Uh, those loans totaled $10 billion. The average size of those loans in the United States amongst credit unions was roughly $49,000. That's basically half of the dollar amount that we saw in the for-profit sector, a clear indication that credit unions were focused on independent, mom-and-pop, small Main Street businesses and not national chain restaurants, not professional sports teams, and so on and so forth. The consultancy Cornerstone Advisors basically underlined this point by saying that credit unions, compared to all of the other lenders, not just banking institutions, but uh, uh, online lenders, the fintech companies, and so forth, credit unions had the biggest jobs impact per million lent of all of the lenders that they examined. And you can see on the next slide the, uh, the index that I've created. Now, this is not a, a comprehensive look at credit union lending. We don't have real-time monthly data on mortgage lending in the United States, but we do have consumer lending, and this is basically a repeat of the graphic that I showed you for the Great Recession, and the conclusion is the same. Essentially, credit unions from a lending perspective continue to engage in the marketplace, and you can see big increases in credit union lending activity on a monthly basis here uh, relative to a very distinct decline in bank lending throughout the, the last nine months or so. This next graphic 
makes it very clear, I think, too, that we have some really big concerns. And there are five of them. And the first one, not surprisingly, has to do with the course of the pandemic here in the United States. As you all more than likely know, the United States has been particularly hard hit. Uh, a lot of it is our own fault, uh, but nevertheless, uh, particularly hard hit. Now, if you look at this graphic, which looks at uh, one measure of the course of the pandemic in the United States, one of the things, and, and the most important thing here, is that uh, almost everywhere we look, we're seeing substantial spikes in the pandemic, sub substantial spikes in uh, not only uh, cases, new cases of COVID-19, but of course, by just about any other measure, hospitalizations, uh, ICU unit uh, uh, capacity, and uh, things like uh, ventilator use and, and actually deaths as well are sort of heading in the wrong direction. All of this says to us that the future does not look so great, at least in the near term. Uh, this suggests to us that there will be less, not more economic activity in the United States in the near term. More geographic areas will have to either close down completely or significantly curtail economic interactions. The, the second thing that we're really concerned about is that is probably the case where you all are as well. Most businesses in the United States are quite small. So uh, there are roughly 8 million business establishments in the United States. 75% of those business establishments are operated by 10 or fewer, actually fewer than 10, full-time equivalent employees. About two-thirds of business establishments are operated by five or fewer full-time uh, equivalent employees. And what that means is that these are particularly vulnerable businesses. They don't have strong balance sheets, they don't have strong income statements, and their ability, all else equal, to make it through a severe economic disruption is hindered because of that inflexibility and because of the fact fin that financially and operationally they don't uh, have the, uh, the muscle that larger uh, businesses have. Moody's Analytics, a consultancy here in the United States, estimates that roughly one million existing business establishments will not make it to the back end of this crisis because of their vulnerabilities and the just the depth of, of the downturn. The third thing that we're concerned about, of course, is the makeup of the job market and the fact that when we lose jobs historically, they don't necessarily come back real fast. Uh, this is a picture of the last nine or so downturns in the United States going all the way back to 1960. It's essentially showing you that in general, the United States in economic downturns loses about one to 3% of the jobs that were outstanding at the beginning of the economic downturns. And basically it takes anywhere from about a year to four years to get those jobs back. The red line here represents the Great Recession when uh, of course, we lost way more than the, the average number of jobs. 6% of the jobs that were outstanding at the beginning of the crisis went away during the crisis, and it took us about six years to get those jobs back. Now, this is what we're living through at the moment. On the next graphic, you can see that uh, essentially, we've, uh, it, during the, the, the beginning of the crisis, lost roughly 15% of the jobs that were outstanding in February of this year. The number of people employed in the United States declined by roughly 20 million. Uh, at the moment, we, you can see a pretty significant improvement in those numbers. We're down 7%, not 15%, but uh, still that's roughly 10 million jobs or so. Uh, if history is a good guide, and, if, and we do think that it will be a good guide, if history is a good guide, more than likely this purple line will not return to zero. We will not gain those jobs back in a short period of time. Uh, again, this gets back to what uh, Kamiar said earlier. Uh, there will be a persistent negative effect for quite a while, and this is part of the reason we believe that will be the case. So the purple line may get uh, is more than likely going to re return to pre-recession levels uh, in the next couple of years. It won't go six years, but it will still be a pretty significant decline that lasts a longer period of time than and I think uh, is commonly believed here in the United States. This next graphic puts a finer point on one of the uh, issues that, uh, that was raised in the previous uh, presentation. And that is 
that the, the effects that we're experiencing are disproportionate. So this is showing you the decline in one segment of the job market in the United States. This is the folks that are employed in leisure and hospitality, roughly 11 million employees in that uh, uh, sector of the economy. Half of those jobs were lost at the beginning of the crisis. We're still down almost 25% in that segment of the, uh, of the job market. And this next, next graphic really, I think, drives it home from a, a broad historical perspective. This is basically taking that same data and dividing it up by uh, earnings. And so these are earnings quartiles in each of the past four economic downturns. And you can see that generally speaking, there's not a huge difference by earnings quartile in terms of the, the percentage of jobs that are lost. Uh, but you can see in the coronavirus crisis, uh, the lowest earning folks, the people on the lower uh, rungs of the economic ladder, uh, the, the nation's most vulnerable citizens are being hit the hardest. And because of that, we think the effects of, of the, the uh, disruption in income, the disruption in wealth, again, will be longer lasting, felt by more people for a longer period of time. And this next graphic uh, shows uh, one of the other things that we're super concerned about. I woke up this morning, here I am in Madison, Wisconsin, about 250 miles north of Chicago. Uh, and I woke up this morning to a snowstorm. Uh, what this says to us is that in a, a wide swath of the northern part of the United States, the folks who were two or three weeks ago sitting out on patios at restaurants in the open air and social distancing will be unable to do that. So uh, this will cause a great disruption in uh, millions of, uh, actually probably hundreds of thousands of businesses in the northern part of the United States that will affect millions of employees that, uh, that are associated with those businesses. And again, this will be something that uh, we'll be wrestling with for the next four or five months. Uh, finally, fifth, uh, we are concerned about the fact that the federal government, which had been very significantly engaged in combating the effects of this crisis, has not been recently. So, the federal government basically attacked this, this crisis in the United States with roughly $4 trillion in direct aid and in indirect aid at the outset of the crisis. Uh, at the moment, we need more help and we're not getting it. And you can see on this next slide uh, exactly what I mean by that. The Census Bureau here in the United States has been doing surveys of consumers throughout the nation. And essentially what those surveys are showing us is that there's a significant chunk of the population at the moment that are very financially distressed. Roughly 80 million American adults today are in households that are having difficulty making uh, payments for the usual household expenses. Roughly 18 million, almost 20 million adults live in households that are behind on rent or mortgage payments. One third of those folks, about 6 million or so, say that they're somewhat to very likely to face eviction or foreclosure in the next two months. This is a really big deal. Uh, the next slide shows you exactly what we think is going to happen from an economic perspective, but I want to jump to the final slide and just spend uh, a couple of minutes, uh, seconds here talking about the effects on credit unions. And I'm going to work my way from left to right on this slide. Uh, in 2019, the most important thing to remember is that in 2019, going into the crisis, credit unions were reporting uh, really, I think, um, incredible financial results. Essentially, all the financial shock absorbers that you would want to be in place going into a crisis were in place. Asset quality was near cyclical highs. But earnings, return on average assets, was at a cyclical high for collectively for all credit unions. And the net worth ratio at 11.4% was essentially just a hair below all-time highs. And so you can see the effects of the crisis. The second circle here shows you that asset quality actually improved at U.S. credit unions, a direct result of that $4 trillion in aid that was provided by the federal government. Return on assets has fallen because interest rates have fallen dramatically. Net interest margin is under pressure. We've waived fees and modified loans, and so there's an effect related to that. And we're getting ready, actually, for the possibility of increases 
in delinquencies and net charge-off rates by provisioning for loan losses, and that also is bringing earnings down a bit. Now, if you look at the top line of data, you can see that savings growth actually increased by 8.3% unannualized in the second quarter. So that's a 32% rate of growth in savings overall and roughly a 30% rate of growth in assets. And that has put significant downward pressure on the credit union net worth ratio, which again started the downturn at almost 11.5%, finished the third quarter at just a hair over 10%, and if our forecast is correct, will finish 2021 at 9.9%. So that would be basically deja vu, a decline of about 150 basis points in the net worth ratio at U.S. credit unions, almost exactly replicating what happened in the Great Recession. So that's the view from the United States. The dislocation is significant. The effects will be, again, felt for a long period of time. And from a financial perspective, credit unions here will feel those effects. The good news is we believe that credit unions will continue to behave as they always have in crisis, will continue to engage with members, and will continue to do whatever they can to get average Americans from the middle of this crisis to the back end as quickly as possible and with as little disruption. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, really, really fascinating presentation. I mean, uh, the, the the last thing that you mentioned, and we, we don't have any cre uh, questions right now from the attendees. If you have a question for Mike, feel free to write it in the Q&A panel. But you mentioned, you mentioned the downward pressure on credit union net worth. Uh, when we talk about it getting under 10%, is that is that the line where it gets really uncomfortable for credit unions? How much more give there is there? Yeah, I think your mic's off, Mike. No, um, the good news is, as I said, we went in with really strong balance sheets. The Prudential regulator here in the United States calls credit unions well capitalized if their capital to asset ratio is 7%. And so we went in with a, a ratio that was 11 and, about 11.5%. Well above that seven percent threshold, and so I don't I don't know I mean no no credit union is comfortable with a with a capital ratio that's falling as quickly as this has fallen I don't think, uh, but we do recognize that the, there there is a big buffer that remains, and and that says uh, that we do still have the wiggle room to continue to help people uh, and and help them in obvious ways. We actually do have a question now from Winston Fletcher, uh, Mr. Fletcher in the Caribbean. Um, he says, Mike, of the number of jobs lost in the U.S., what percentage is likely to return and over what time period? So, I mean, eventually, all, you know, it won't be necessarily the exact jobs that were lost that come back, uh, but employment levels generally will return to pre-recession levels. Our baseline forecast at the moment uh, basically has the unemployment rate elevated as far as the eye can see. So we, we, our baseline forecast at the moment goes out to the end of 2022. We believe at the end of 22, the unemployment rate will remain above pre-recession levels. So, you know, the unemployment rate was quite, quite low in February, almost three and a half percent or thereabouts. Uh, we believe more than likely that that unemployment rate will be close to 5%, four and a half to 5%, uh, two and a half years out or so. Um, this is a great question because every time I pick up the trades or see them on my computer, I see mergers happening all over the United States. And Dennison asks, do you foresee an increase an increase in credit union mergers due to the economic impacts of COVID-19? Uh, we expect that to happen. If history is a good guide, it will happen. We think history will be a good guide. Uh, the, the important point to remember is that historically, when we see consolidation within credit unions, it typically happens after the recessions are over. So normally, during economic downturns, we don't see a lot of merger activity. Um, uh, more than likely, we'll see a bit of an acceleration at the back end, and it will be concentrated, as I alluded to earlier, in smaller institutions, more than likely, again, if history is a good guide, because, uh, of course, like all businesses, smaller institutions are more vulnerable. They don't have the same sorts of operational flexibility, they tend to be, uh, for example, uh, less, uh, they t tend to exhibit less asset diversification, less diversification in membership, 
And you know, that's one of, the, one of the defining characteristics of this downturn. We have credit unions in the United States with, with fields of membership that are firmly focused on things like leisure and hospitality, hotels and restaurants and that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, larger or small, uh, those will be disproportionately uh, impacted as well. But we do expect a bit of, a, of an increase, not, not a substantial uh, number, but a bit of an acceleration in merger activity. One final question for you, uh, Robert in St. Lucia again asking, coming out of the crisis, is there a greater role for credit unions to play in fueling greater than normal growth in the SME sector? I mean, so I think that generally speaking, credit unions are firmly focused on improving financial well-being, both for consumers and for businesses, small businesses, mom and pop shops. And I believe that, yes, if history is a good guide, you will see an acceleration across the board of credit union activity coming out of every downturn. And I've lived through three big ones now, the savings and loan crisis, the Great Recession, and this one. In the previous two that I have direct experience with, what happened was average Americans, average workers, and average small businesses recognized that, that in the crisis, credit unions behaved differently they learn from their peers, their friends that are credit union members, that, the, that these institutions behave differently. They behaved in more pro-consumer and pro-social ways than, than the for-profit sector. Word spreads, people become interested, and we tend to see in the wake of these, these disruptions, membership growth at US credit unions, it's five, six, seven times the rate of US population growth. So um, broadly speaking, uh, we feel like uh, credit unions will help to advance all forms of economic activity in the wake of, of the downturn. So there is some good news on the horizon. Mike, thanks so much. Really excellent information. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, we turn now to one of World Council's partners in Latin America. Adrian Rodriguez is the CEO of the Federation of Savings and Credit Cooperatives of Costa Rica, or FIDIAC. They are a direct member organization of the World Council that represents and supports the interests of 15 credit unions, which as a whole represent about 91% of the total population or total participation in Costa Rica's credit union sector. And he's joining us to discuss now how COVID-19 has impacted credit unions in that part of the world. Adrian, thanks for joining us. Thank you, uh, Greg. Uh, I would like to, he hello everyone, first of all, and I would like to thank all my Local colleagues for this opportunity to share my thoughts about the effects of the coronavirus is causing in Latin America credit unions. Uh, I agree uh, in several points uh, from Mike's and Camiar presentation uh, presentations. Um, this is why for me it's very especially important that here in Latin America we need to understand that this crisis is just a starting, uh, which means uh, we are just trying to control the health crisis. And we hope for a vaccine to, to control the, or to minimize the impact of the health crisis. But um, the social and economic effects from this crisis will last longer, perhaps three to five years. Um, this is a good um, uh, time frame that we are looking at three to five years. That means uh, the effects could be ending or being minimized by the end of 22, 23, 24. And that's why we need to face, we're facing a great challenge in two different directions. One is how to survive as financial institutions, how to survive as credit unions itself, but at the same time, how to be an active player in the country's economic reactivation or restructuration, right? And, uh, and, and, and is so for some credit unions or some countries could be difficult to play both both games at the same time. Okay, 
You can see there in, the, in this uh, um, slide, after one year since the coronavirus first case was confirmed in China, uh, the world is just waiting for a vaccine. And we had since then more than 55 million people has been infected and more than 425,000 people has died. And the country, Latin America, contributes a fifth of a fifth of the global confirmed cases. We are, um, or share in this thing is 20, around 22% of the total cases. Um, as you see there, uh, I, I, I add the 10 countries in Latin America based in the confirmed cases. And we have countries there, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, uh, Panama, Bolivia. So countries where there are great, great credit union movements that are seriously impacted by this social and economic crisis. So for how long will last the health crisis? the health crisis, well, as I said, nobody knows. We are just waiting for an effective vaccine. And perhaps the only certainty we have is waiting for the vaccine, that's all. And, and in Latin America, we have uh, 30 different countries uh, where governments has different capacities, uh, the local movements has different capacities, different strengths. So it's difficult to have a global picture for the region because it, it is, is, is diverse, it's very diverse. Um, the global recession uh, that we are experiencing uh, are sending the whole region back to 2004, uh, uh, indicators in terms of unemployment. In Latin America, the employment right now is estimated at 8.1%, and perhaps is bigger than that, but this is official data, is bigger than that. And poverty is estimated as of 2018 at the 29%, 30% of poverty in the whole region. And we are still having high levels of uh, informal businesses and, and uh, bankruptcies, and small business, etc. And the point here is, as, as my previous colleague said, the market, the biggest market disruption is the need of social distancing. And uh, many businesses cannot survive in this context for longer. Everything about entertainment, even tourism, tourism and a lot of other businesses. Well, global, according to the International Monetary Fund and the Global Bank, some uh, projections for the next year, you can see uh, um, they are saying or forecasting that next year we have a positive economic growth in the globally and in the region, in, in, in Latin America. Well, we don't know, this is just a projection, okay? But um, the point here, even if this projection is, is right, the point is the Latin America is well behind the global output forecast. So Latin America will be experiencing uh, serious economic issues after even uh, the global or, or Europe or, or other countries could be uh, reactivating economies or could be growing faster, but Latin America will be behind, apparently. Well, um, what has been, we are seeing these different effects. This is an even impact, uh, even in each particular country, it's an even impact. What we are seeing here is uh, there are some industry that are more impacted than others. Tourism and everything about entertainment is the, the most impacted industry everywhere, I think so. Aviation, transportation, uh, everything about automotive industry, real estate, construction, uh, manufacture less than that, financial services, education. 
But the least impacted industry, we have uh, medical services, uh, everything about pharmaceutical services, pharmacies, equipment, supplies, food processing, uh, personal care, telecommunications, retail, agriculture a little bit. And then when we see credit unions, uh, how credit unions are playing the game now, where are they putting the money, in which industries they are investing. This is an example from Costa Rica credit unions. And we are seeing that some credit unions that are focused in the uh, medical service market, where most of, of members are in the medical services industry, are even they are, they are financing the small businesses, clinics, uh, uh, doctors, etc. The loan portfolio this year, as of August of this year, the, the loan portfolio is increasing 9%, 9.8%. Other credit unions working with different uh, uh, in food uh, services, cattle, milk producers, they are increasing always, they are increasing all, uh, also 9%, 9.5%. Other credit unions, which are focused uh, on uh, tourism, small businesses, hotels, hostels, and agriculture, more or less, dep depending on the region, are just uh, at the break-even level. Uh, they are not uh, increasing much, but there is a no big contraction. But others, credit unions, which works uh, principally with financial services workers, so workers from, uh, employees from banks or financial services, they are contracting 3%. And other credit unions, which are serving uh, teachers and education workers are contracting 6%. So that means that not all industries or economic segments are impacted in the same in the same way, and some credit unions here are looking the way to increase business with those with those economic segments that are more dynamic right now. And this is a good lesson for the whole Latin America. Credit unions need to change, need to refocus, need to review uh, in which segments are they working, etc., to uh, overcome this crisis. Um, <clears throat> The institute, okay, talking about uh, health crisis, as Goku has said before, the three waves, etc. Well, health crisis, health crisis perhaps will be under control next year if we get an effective vaccine. But now, the institutional stress. In many countries, we have different programs from governments, supporting credit unions, supporting liquidity, etc. Um, but we feel that this 2021, will be the uh, more uh, um, difficult year. Because in many countries, the, uh, those programs from the government will be a start, uh, will be a stop, or will be, uh, yeah, the government has a limited capacity to steer, to, to support uh, uh, the economy in Latin America. And the, the, some support measures will be stopping this 21. Um, that means, Credit unions will uh, have to, to, to manage all those loans that they have been uh, um, re refinancing and, and uh, they need to do more uh, provisions, perhaps support some losses, uh, and uh, perhaps not all businesses uh, benefit from, from the loan restructuring benefits will be able to come back, et cetera. So we have a lot of effects and those effects are different from one country to one another. Also supervisory uh, institutions, governments are, are, are asking credit unions for more provisions, for capital requirements, and, and that will be the difficult thing next year. Asset, as, as uh, I think Mike was talking about, the asset quality, profitability, uh, delinquency rates, of course, that's a key factor, how credit unions are managing asset quality, loan portfolio quality, provisions, 
institutional capital uh, to support losses. That is very important. Mike, Mike said something very important. Credit unions in the United States get into the crisis with the strong balance sheets. And that is a key factor. Here in Costa Rica, we are seeing that those credit unions with better capacities, with the strong balance sheets, with better provision, with better institutional capital, et cetera, are supporting the prices very well. So well, not, not very well, but are supporting better than others. Okay. Um, also, we are thinking about restructuring uh, credit union sector, the stabilization plans. Most of the credit union uh, or, or yeah, credit union federations or national associations here in Latin America are talking about the need of a stabilization plan and think about it and design stabilization plans um, to support uh, um, this uh, restructuring sector. We can see, uh, we, can, we, can, we can say that. Uh, we also are thinking about what happened with the toxic, toxic assets. After some period of having problems with, uh, uh, with the delinqu high delinquency rates or provisions or whatever, we will need to, dis to, to, to manage some toxic assets. And perhaps that will be in 2022. We need the tools for that. And well, some countries we are working for that, for tools for that. And there is a risk of contagion effect in the financial system. Okay, in some countries, credit unions are, are big. And here in Costa Rica, credit unions are 11% of the total financial system. So if credit unions get into a financial crisis, the whole financial system could be in danger. It depends on the country, okay? Well, uh, just to finish with some conclusions, um, credit unions are differently impacted by COVID-19 according to the local economy diversification. That's important. Every country is different. If the, if the local or the country economy is more than diversified than others, perhaps they will, they, they will be able to better overcome the crisis. And also credit unions, loan portfolio diversification is very important. Those countries that are related, highly related to tourism are more uh, problems than others. Those credit unions that are uh, invested or the loan portfolio is highly concentrated in those in those most impacted industry are having more problems than others. Uh, credit unions also are differently impacted according to their in institutional capacities and strengths in which IT and digital services are key factors for overcoming market changes. Uh, we are seeing that those credit unions that already have some degree, good, good uh, uh, digital channels, etc., are better, um, better uh, facing the crisis than others. Um, <clears throat> credit unions also are different impacted by COVID according to financial disciplines and asset quality standards they follow. And this is what Mike were, was saying. Uh, those with the strong balance sheets are in better position. Now, um, there is a clear gap, and uh, uh, here in Latin America or Costa Rica, we can see that very clearly. There is a clear gap between supervised credit unions and those that are not supervised. What we are seeing now here is those credit unions that are not supervised by central banks are weaker than the others that are supervised by uh, central banks. In other terms, credit unions with a strong balance sheet are those that are supervised by central banks or any other government institution. Um, national institutions like FEDEAC or uh, federations uh, responds to this uh, crisis must, must consider those factors or these factors I am saying in their institutional strengthening strategies. Um, I, uh, I am sure that every every federation or national association here in Latin America is trying to support their, their, their sector, but the strategies could be different because 
uh, effects are multiple effects and, uh, and different directions and depends of the uh, trade union sector reality and, um, and also country economic diversification or reality. Finally, I agree with, uh, with, with Mike uh, and that not all trade unions will survive the crisis, perhaps not all, and it's better to merge before it's too late. And this is something that national associations need to analyze and, 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 and to have a strategy for that, have, the, have a, um, a program for that and, uh, and develop some tools for that. If we are thinking that we are just trying to minimize the impact of the health crisis with one vaccine next year, and the social economic uh, effects will last three to five years. So we still have a lot of things to do. And that is perhaps the, 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 the last message that I would like to share with you all. Thank you. Adrian, thanks so much. That's great information. Um, and I and, and you know it's interesting to hear what you say about the economic diversification because we're seeing that in a lot of um, not emerging and emerging markets where that diversification for the credit unions is important. Uh, we should mention that Adrian is also a, a member. He sits on World Council's COVID-19 response committee. So he also has a very good grasp of the differences that people are seeing from around the world with credit unions and the impacts from COVID-19. We're running a little bit behind schedule, Adrian, so we're going to go ahead to our next speaker. Um, and that is uh, uh, a perspective from the Caribbean on how COVID-19 is impacting credit unions there. For that, we're going to be joined by Dr. Patrick Antoine. He is a consultant on international finance, economic policy, international trade, agricultural policy at Econotech Limited in Trinidad and Tobago. And he was invited to speak today by our Caribbean Confederation of Credit Unions. They are a direct member of World Council. Dr. Antoine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I wanna pick up from where uh, the colleague Adrian Rodriguez would have, would have um, ended when he spoke about not all are impacted in the same way. And this is why I think um, for me, the launching part is definitely going to be that the differential impacts of COVID-19 uh, and uh, they're going to vary across the member states of the Caribbean, which is a little different to the uh, perspectives that we have heard in relation to one country, depending, of course, on the nature and the magnitude of these. And I think um, it, it's important to recognize that the Caribbean as a, a region that's been uh, particularly vulnerable to natural disasters comes, uh, comes into this, this, this period having uh, combated 9-11, but, but having not overcome it. And, and so a number of the structural and financial weaknesses that have been in, uh, has been there in 9-11 continued. That, uh, of course, went into the uh, financial crisis. And, and again, uh, we've had lingering effects of the financial crisis on the economies. And of course, uh, it's well known that the uh, natural disasters have been particularly uh, pernicious on the region. And so, the region comes into uh, this period um, with um, GDP growth, as it were, at low rates. But again, it's not even because we have, if you wish, 15 or 17 member states, depending on what, uh, what measure you use. And so you've had some member states like Jamaica and Grenada, where the economic growth rates over the last two to three years have been particularly strong. Uh, you have others where the, where the growth rates have been particularly weak. And so as a region, although the average is 1%, um, you know, there are, in fact, some outliers. It's true to say, however, as a region, that uh, we've been coming into this, uh, this period with low growth rates and, of course, with increasing social and economic, uh, macroeconomic vulnerability. The, the, the implication of this, of course, is that the recovery will be slow and uh, it's going to have a tremendously high cost on the economic and social fabric of our societies. And in fact, we have been looking as well at uh, recovery taking place over the 2022-2023 period at best. And um, though we've seen some improvement in per capita income uh, over the last three years, uh, the point remains that we're coming into this period particularly weak. 
Um, in terms of unemployment, it's important to understand where we were as well. Uh, we've had some improvements in unemployment in a couple of the countries. In Jamaica, again, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago has had low unemployment rates for a number of years. In fact, um, uh, you would say that they're closest to full employment. But you've had some uh, regions where the level of unemployment has been particularly high. I want to draw your attention to the fact that the unemployment rate among youth, which I haven't um, uh, heard us speak to yet, is, is in this region about 47%. And of course, that's a bellwether of what this crisis could do. And I think it's also important for credit unions to appreciate that as a risk, but also as an opportunity. The, the informal uh, sector, which creates employment in this region, in Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole, uh, the metrics there are about uh, 158 million workers, or 54%. In the Caribbean, it's not very different, but it does vary uh, from country to country. So for instance, the informal sector in Jamaica is larger as a uh, proportion than the informal sector in countries in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. That would be Grenada, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Antigua, Dominica, St. Kitts, Nevis. And they operate a fixed exchange rate system, so they have some buffer. It's pegged to the US dollar. Uh, the GDP, of course, also has uh, some, some other implications for poverty. And um, I also wanted to point to the fact that in terms of poverty rates, we're talking about 37.3% for the region as a whole. And of course, this is likely to rise according to the forecast that we've had from ECLAC by about 13.5 percentage points. Now, it would not be uh, accurate for us to finish in any discussion of unemployment and where we are, where we ought to go, without recognizing the impact of the tourism and the services sector in CARICOM and in the Caribbean, which of course is, uh, is quite large. We will come to that, only to see that in looking at what uh, COVID will, will, will do in terms of impacts, you're also looking uh, in, in many instances, in most instances perhaps, uh, at, at what it will do to services and tourism employment. Uh, we've made the point here that uh, one of the consequences of the COVID crisis is that we have the phenomenon of working at home. And of course, we're seeing that that is only possible for certain kinds of jobs. It's about 23% of workers. And uh, troubling to us is the fact that the most vulnerable and unskilled are not able to work from home, and that becomes an issue too. The balance of payments coming into this crisis and where that will go is that we've had some chronic problems in countries such as Suriname, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, not as chronic, but quite serious. And uh, uh, coming out of this crisis uh, over the next uh, two to three years, we expect that those circumstances will only become a lot more drastic. The countries have taken a number of positive steps. In the case of Suriname, they now made the decision to go to the IMF. Um, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, they're doing some very innovative restructuring, and they do have a little bit of fiscal space. So coming out of this, if the right decisions are made, these countries in the region could be stronger, but many others don't have the fiscal space to make those adjustments. And as such, we, we are likely to see, uh, again, some, uh, some weakening of our economies. And because the economies are so small and open, uh, the credit unions within them are also going to be impacted directly um, by uh, what, what happens in the macro economy. I add, of course, the fact that in many of these countries, government is the largest employer. I make the, uh, the, the, the counterpoint that um, uh, unlike many of the other countries in Latin America and the Caribbean and the hemisphere, where you have growing reserves is often an indication of strength. In the case of the countries that we're looking at in the Caribbean, for many of them, there have been positive growing reserves. Uh, that, however, reflects the fact that imports have pulled back so substantially uh, that, uh, that uh, there is, in fact, a buildup of U.S. dollars where it's tied to the United States dollar. Uh, for many other countries, uh, the reserves have fallen, and that will become more critical. In the case of the countries where the reserves are positive, uh, again, it's no bright spot, because what happens there is that since the growth is import-driven, a lot of the pullback is in terms of capital growth, the import of capital items, and that has implications for growth as well. To make the point that the countries are, of course, highly open, and of course, that becomes, as you will see, uh, one of the issues that has impacted uh, and will continue to impact where the countries grow and where the, where the, where the uh, credit unions must locate themselves. The import-driven uh, growth uh, in, in a number of areas where the countries have uh, and should have some competitive advantage, but which have been ignored for one reason or another. Um, the Dutch disease syndrome in the case of the 
oil producing countries of Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, and uh, unfortunately, um, if we're not careful, Guyana. Uh, has also taken attention away from diversification. In the case of the other countries, um, the growth uh, that is import-driven has been has emerged largely because we've had a concentration of resources in tourism. Uh, foreign direct investment is interesting because it fell sharply, but already we see with the stimulus packages from the United States and Europe a rebounding of that. And, and I want to make the point here too that uh, in the countries where they are. Uh, citizenship by investment programs, uh, which is, of course, quite similar to the pensionario program in Costa Rica, but where it allows for citizenship uh, by investment, we've seen a particularly strong performance um, in terms of foreign direct investment. Levels of indebtedness is a problem in the Caribbean. It's well known. We've had a number of countries make some progress. And the point here is that coming out of this crisis, we're likely to see that progress reversed. And of course, that's quite troubling. Um, if we look at the uh, indebtedness in terms of the countries, we also see a number of countries where the ratings have already fallen, and that, of course, is going to mean that the cost of borrowing will go up at a time when they need to be borrowing more at lower rates. Uh, in the case of the uh, business community, uh, we've seen from monetary policy expansion, the rates come down, but the, those facilities are largely uh, only open to the larger, more established and medium-sized businesses. What we've called the category three is the small businesses and category four, the micro. That's become interestingly more difficult uh, coming out of this crisis. And of course, that's an opportunity for the credit unions, cautiously so, but an opportunity nonetheless. Importantly, linked to the way in which I think credit unions must look at this period is the fact that remittances in our region, which of course is significant in the case of Haiti and Jamaica and Dominica, among other countries, going right down to about only 1% of GDP in Trinidad and Tobago, that those have fallen. And of course, with, with the remittances falling and, not, and, and with them not rebounding for the next uh, uh, two to three to four years is our focus, that, uh, that spells some troubling signs for personal wealth and for consumption. Um, what we're seeing here very quickly is that um, our performance in terms of the vulnerability of the banking and financial sector where increasingly credit unions continue to, uh, to perform strongly as a whole, with, of course, uh, uh, some, uh, some qualifiers I will raise, raise later. We've seen a varied performance across the, the countries. In the case of the ECCU and uh, the countries that are linked to bank and fund programs, we've seen consolidation and a shoring up of the banking system. In other countries, we've seen vulnerability. And of course, there's the external factors which are linked to the banking systems in the Caribbean of them being blacklisted, et cetera, et cetera, which of course has implications for um, interconnectivity, banking, um, uh, uh, corresponding banking relationships, et cetera. That has implications for the credit union too in terms of remittances and transfers. Profitability, of course, is down in many of these countries so that we expect that the current account deficit will continue to perform strongly. But that's not really a good sign again, because uh, with profitability down and dividends and net outflows down, it means that businesses in those countries are not performing well, the extent that they can't produce or generate profit and export dividends. And of course, that is something that we have to watch out very, very closely as well. Fiscal performance, all I can see here is that uh, the presentation will have that, but um, the fiscal performance has been uh, particularly troubling with countries having to spend on COVID. Many of them have tried to maintain a steady state position of cutting back expenditure on key um, uh, areas at home, uh, while at the same time, um, you know, trying to sustain the spend on the health sector. What is true across all of these countries is a drastic fall in revenues, and we're not likely to see a rebound in revenue again for the next two to three years. And the, the decline has ranged from uh, uh, 40% to 80% in some countries. So again, uh, emerging with a weaker fiscal position. Um, the uh, concern to us here too is the fact that the region continues to be over-concentrated, both on services and in commodities. Very few of them export more than uh, you know, 10 or 12 commodities of any substance. And of course, the ones that perform best uh, the uh, petroleum exporting countries of Trinidad and Tobago that dominates about 52% of intra-regional trade, 
Suriname, and of course, increasingly Guyana, which has a focus of having growth in GDP of nearly 50% uh, in 2020, and more in 2021 as an exception. The troubling thing here is that commodity prices have fallen, and not a lot of CARICOM countries are exporting food and other things in the other categories. What that's meant is that for the commodity exporters, they have not done as well as the, as the uh, countries that have been exporting some food. So in Jamaica and the countries that have been exporting a more diversified range of food products, the impact is going to be less on them. Happily in Jamaica, they have been responding to this crisis. And uh, that's been, of course, a counter, um, it's, it's acted as a, as a uh, counterpoint on, uh, on the imports and also on the uh, poor economic performance that's come from COVID. Uh, the Caribbean is, is one of the most, if not uh, perhaps actually, but the Caribbean is the most tourism dependent country. And it is also the most services dependent country measured by GDP in the world. And of course, that has direct implications um, for, uh, for where we go with the recovery. As I speak to you in Trinidad and Tobago, in terms of the wholesale, retail, uh, trade, hotel and restaurant sector, that employs 127,000 people in a population of 1.3 million. And that's not, of course, counting the multiplier effects on families. And that sector is still partially under lockdown with bars and restaurants not being able to serve dining. And they have not been able to do so since about April. The implications of that for the country is, of course, um, quite severe in terms of economic relations, in terms of poverty. And I just wanted to point very quickly to the fact that um, the Caribbean faces the challenge coming into this uh, period of COVID of weak, in, weak integration with our regional and global value chains. What that does is, 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 is two things. One, it gives us an opportunity to develop those value chains. And I will point, of course, to the next initiative, which is major and a major lead behind for this conference. The heads of government in 2018 identified reducing food imports by 25% by 2025 as a major objective for CARICOM countries. They have uh, allowed a new organization called the CARICOM Private Sector Organization to lead on behalf of the private sector for the first time, and that initiative is ongoing. There is a massive amount of unprecedented interest, which will see economic activity taking place here at all levels. This is a role, and there is a place in this for the credit unions. And I just wanted to point to that very quickly. In industries such as poultry, cassava, uh, the meats, mutton, beef, pork, uh, in uh, the production of, um, of uh, uh, feedstock, and, uh, and also in some exotic items such as coconut water and coconut products, for which there is a burgeoning global market in billions of dollars. Uh, in terms of poverty coming into this crisis, I mentioned it before, the region was not strong, poverty will increase. What we've seen since COVID is wage cuts. We've seen tourism, the tourism-induced effects uh, take its toll on the sectors. And we've also seen a number of sectors still need employment, which, of course, is why we have uh, pos posited that unemployment could grow significantly. I want to go very quickly to talk about um, the uh, suggestions. The rest will be in the paper. Um, the suggestions for the credit union. Massive opportunity coming from COVID for digitalization. I've never seen the Caribbean governments more mobilized around this subject as they are now. There's an opportunity for things such as uh, online home banking options for members, online assistance. Massive opportunity too for uh, the credit unions to assist in funding micro and small enterprises in ICT readiness. Uh, absolutely critical. Those that have been ready have performed better than those that have not been ICT ready in this crisis. FinTech solutions. I once spoke about it at an invitation um, uh, event that the credit unions uh, had me at two years ago. Still an opportunity for um, the payment apps and payment platforms. There is, a, there is an interesting construct called a reciprocal trade platform, which allows uh, firms and entities to trade surplus uh, stock and to trade surplus capacity. I can give more on this later, but I believe that in a context where so many people are being made redundant, that this is an excellent opportunity for the credit unions to use its membership and its platform to, uh, as it were, motivate and coordinate perhaps um, the emergence of these reciprocal trade platforms. I think there's going to be a need for uh, future liquidity funding 
uh, as we look at what's happened with a number of the uh, credit unions, particularly the weaker ones. And of course, the issue here becomes how do we then start thinking about a credit union reserve? Shared services, particularly in this period, a number of credit unions that are not strong um, are facing this issue of uh, spiraling debt. And I believe that the lack of capacity in these credit unions gives an opportunity for the uh, shared services in debt collection. Developing a virtual community, I spoke about this before, the credit unions, if they were able to link their memberships, can create a tremendous amount of economic activity, solidarity, and of course, create wealth. Uh, the uh, new service industries in the Caribbean that uh, have been uh, particularly weak, they were weak going into COVID, and they now appear even weaker in education. Much of the teaching takes place online, but many of the children and students in the rural community do not have access to either the technology or the devices. There's an opportunity here for the credit unions to work with them. I've linked that to technology, the productive sectors. Tremendous opportunity for the productive sectors, particularly in the 25 by 25 area that I've mentioned earlier, but in a number of others, creating diversified technology products. And a number of those are particularly interesting for youth, where the unemployment rate is about 47%, as I said earlier. Tremendous opportunity, too, for uh, what we've heard discussed, which is the mergers. We have to find a way to save weak credit unions. They have been weak coming into this crisis. Many of them appear even weaker now. And before there is a systemic, uh, before there is collapse, which of course just adds to the systemic risk, not that I believe credit unions uh, bring any greater systemic risk than banks, uh, we, should, uh, we should see to what extent those mergers can take place. And finally, I want to leave with the credit union a unique opportunity where the CARICOM private sector organization has just been inaugurated as an associate member of the CARICOM heads of government. That gives the credit union an opportunity to lobby and to engage with heads of government to get the much needed changes that they wanted in legislation and in the way that they have, uh, they, they have articulated in their strategic plans, they need to go um, over the next several years. This opportunity where the heads are engaged will not come again. And I challenge the credit unions today to engage with this opportunity through the CARICOM private sector organization. Gentlemen, I thank you. It's really interesting, Dr. Antoine, because you know the Caribbean has so many differences from Latin America, which has so many differences from the US when it comes to credit unions and the sectors they serve and, and how it impacts them uh, you know, in terms of whether they're employee credit unions and if so, what industries are those employees in? All kinds of great information there. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we are a little over on time. I just wanna to say to folks, if you have questions for any of the speakers, please feel free to send them via email to communications at woku.org, communications at woku.org, and I will try to get them to the uh, speaker that, that you wanted to ask that question about. That's gonna do it for this webinar. This is our uh, the third COVID-19 response committee webinar now. We do have a few more coming up. You can go to the events page at woku.org. That's woku.org, W-O-C-C-U.org. Click on events, you can see all of the scheduled webinars coming up. And if you want to see a video of this presentation of this webinar today, you can go to our YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash W-O-C-C-U. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you in the United States, have a great Thanksgiving. And for those of you elsewhere, have a great week.